Thank you for coming today. I was invited by my uh, supervisor to prepare a presentation on how we make the high purity rare earth metals here at Ames Laboratory because there's a lot of attention right now on uh, rare earth metals and not necessarily a lot of knowledge out there on how it's actually done. Uh, we're not going to be breaking any new scientific ground with this presentation because uh, we've been doing the same process essentially since the 50s. However, if you're unfamiliar with the process, hopefully you'll learn something new and gain an understanding on how to make a high purity rare earth metal. First off, I'm from the Materials Preparation Center, which is a Department of Energy specialized research center at the Ames Laboratory, and it is our mission to supply the research community with high purity materials so they are not materials limited in their research. First, some acknowledgments. Uh, our MPC is primarily funded by the uh, BES section of the DOE, that's Basic Energy Sciences, and we're in the Materials Discovery, Design and Synthesis, Synthesis and Processing Science Core Research Area. That's a mouthful, uh, but that's uh, where we're at. Um, Tom LaGrasso is our Division Director, and the Director of the MPC, of which I am employed in, is Larry Jones. Much of the data and the processing uh, knowledge about how we make the Ames materials has been published a long time ago, and much of this presentation I've drawn from those resources. There are a lot more resources than what's shown, but these are the primary resources. Uh, the book, The Rare Earths by Frank Spedding and Daney as editors has several chapters on preparation methods. Uh, the two chapters that we're primarily following in our recipe, if you want to call it that, are chapter eight and chapter six. Uh, Bernie Beaudry and Paul Palmer, who made the rare earth metals for many years at the Ames Laboratory and who have subsequently required, retired, um, have several papers on the production process. Dr. Geschneider has several papers on the production process and how to make high purity metals in the Handbook of Physics and Chemistry of the Rare Earth, Chapter 2, mainly res with respect to the way we do it. And another resource, a lanthanide lanthology, which is actually produced by Molly Corp several years ago, is a nice handy reference to have when you want to just know some basic knowledge on the rare earth metals and other compounds. Now I'll give a very brief history of the rare earths because it started in 1794 and we don't have time to talk about every scientist who uh, discovered and or elucidated more about the rare earths. Uh, however, it was discovered in 1794. In uh, 1827, the first preparation of an actual rare earth metal was made. And I'd like you to note that uh, it took roughly 100 years to make them in pure enough form that they could definitively determine the crystal structures of the metals. Uh, about another 10 years to actually um, learn how to separate the oxides in a pure enough form that you didn't have to spend years and years and years doing what's called uh, fractional crystallization to prepare high purity oxides. Uh, here at the Ames Lab, Spedding and others worked on the separation of rares by ion exchange, then applied their knowledge of metallurgy they learned from the Manhattan Project into developing the Ames process for making rare earth metals. And it was very similar to the Ames process for making uranium metal that they used during the Manhattan Project. Uh, their names are quite interesting to hear people pronounce when they've never encountered them before. I get calls from purchasing agents wanting a small sample and uh, they can, they can uh, basically annihilate any of those pronunciations. Uh, scandium, yttrium, top two, dysprosium, down here people struggle with. Um, Many of their names are derived from the Greek roots or Scandinavian language. Euterbe, Sweden is where they discovered. It's several rare names with that root. Uh, you can find this information uh, all on Wikipedia, even though this originally uh, was gathered together in a publication by the Rare Earth Information Center, 200 Years of Rare Earths. This is a very ubiquitous chart that was prepared by the U.S. Geological Survey concerning the abundance of the rare earth elements. And we call them rare earths, but in reality they're not as rare as the rarest metals. Here this yellow island is the rarest, rarest metals. Gold is over here. Silver is not on the island, but it's right here. And they are all less abundant than the rare earths, which are all in the blue, the lanthanide series. And then we got yttrium over here. Now the reason they were called rare is because it took a while to actually figure them out as opposed to a lot of the other elements. Gold 
you can mine gold and get in your mine and hack through the ground and you'll produce a chunk of gold nugget. Copper over here, if you lived in the upper peninsula of Michigan or uh, main body of Michigan, you could just walk through the forest and find, find pieces of copper called float copper sitting on the ground. When it comes to the rare earths, they're essentially dirt. And they're all mixed together in various proportions, but all of them all, 15, 17, if you want to throw in the other two, mixed together. And they're very similar in chemical nature, which makes it very hard to take the dirt and separate them out into just the cerium component or just the lanthanum component. It's an expensive chemical process. But truly they are not rare. It's kind of a misnomer. Uh, the rare earths, the reason they're of such high interest today is they used to be cheap, uh, but China has started to reduce export quotas and consume most of the rare earth oxides internal to China and it's causing a lot of stir. Here's some historical price data. Uh, this, this chart is normalized for oxides um, with respect to 1985 prices, and the yellow spike is the spike of interest, and that was a spike in dysprosium prices, dysprosium oxide, uh, when demand outpaced supply, and there was a significant amount of speculation associated with that, and we've all experienced that with the uh, oil prices. More recently, you can see from this chart, these are uh, oxide prices. If we look at just lanthanum in 2004, $1.60 per kilogram for 99% pure material, today on the order of $60 a gram. A very technologically important rare earth, dysprosium, $31 a kilogram, 2004, almost $300 a kilogram today. And that's all based on demand, price demand curve. Now we're going to skip all this history on the rare, the rare earths at this point and start talking about how we make them. And when it comes to metallurgical processes and you want to make pure materials, there's really only two ways to make a pure material. You either don't put the impurities in to begin with, you keep them out, or you find some slick way of pulling them out at the end. And we actually do a, both of those things. But it all starts with the physical properties themselves of the elements we're trying to create uh, from the oxide. This chart here shows the physical properties of the rare earths with respect to boiling point and melting point, starting with scandium on this end and moving across to the end member lutetium in the lanthanide series. And we can see they vary quite a bit. These are the boiling points, and these are the melting points. And there's a drastic difference in these, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But the Ames process itself really boils down to this page here. What does Ames do to make the high purity metals that we're known around the world for? Uh, it starts with high purity oxides from ion exchange. We used to do ion exchange here at the lab, but that has moved off into commercial areas, and they are still doing ion exchange today. Uh, there is no one in the United States doing ion exchange. It's all done in China at this point, although there are groups that we know about that are talking about starting up ion exchange processes for commercial purposes. So we start with a high purity oxide. Then for all but four of the rare earths, we convert those to fluorides. Then we'll take that fluoride and we'll mix it with calcium metal and the calcium reduces the fluoride leaving behind the rare earth metal. The four that we don't use that process, we go straight from the oxides and reduce it with lanthanum and lanthanum converts to an oxide releasing the other metal as a gas and we'll talk more about that. The problem is we can summarize the Ames process on one page. So that kind of makes it seem like it's a very simple process, when actually it's a very equipment and labor intensive process. Um, especially starting with the fluorination, we, we use anhydrous hydrogen fluoride to convert our oxide. And that's a nasty material, um, but is the way to get the best, highest purity fluoride. Next, when we do that, uh, we take the fluoride, we, we mix it with the calcium, we have to start with a high purity calcium. And find a suitable crucible material to conduct this reaction in. And item number four is actually the easiest, but again, we have to find a crucible material that's suitable for this reaction. Now the question is, does the Ames process always equal high purity? And I'll just answer it right now, no it doesn't. There are lots of ways we can ruin our metal, upset the, upset the souffle, um, 
oxygen's a main player. We can have an incomplete conversion of the oxide. We can have oxygen introduced through the calcium reductant. If we simply use poor handling processes or vacuum technique, we can add oxygen. Uh, the other gases, nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, same, same kind of thing. Uh, we're using a very finely divided oxide and finely divided powder for the fluoride in many cases. Those can adsorb oxygen, adsorb nitrogen from the air, carbon dioxide from the air, and that'll be retained in your process. Um, calcium is one of our reductants and you have to go to extra steps to get rid of the calcium reductant after you've made the metal. And there's some metal transition metals. You don't want any of these magnetic transition metals in your final material. Uh, they can come from several sources, our crucible material, uh, impurities in the oxide if we're not careful, or possibly the HF, or contamination during handling. So one of our concerns is cross-contamination in the processing line. Um, we have one processing line, so we have to clean up everything very nicely before we go to the next metal. And let's say, for example, if we're making a three kilogram batch of lanthanum, something the size of a grain of sand has enough impurity in it to ruin the high purity status. Take it from what we would consider Ames grade material to a non Ames grade material. So if you imagine we're going from one glove box to one furnace, uh, from another furnace from the fluorination system, that's a lot of cleaning we have to do, make sure the things are very clean. So we like to be, people think in terms of, we're not a foundry, we're not a, but we're not as clean as a chip fabrication facility, but we want to be as clean as possible. So when we talk about purity, um, people like to talk in the terms of how many nines is it? And you'll see things like five nines or four nines, a four N, a five N on paperwork with respect to metals. Um, a lot of times they're talking in terms of rare earths, strictly about the intra rare earth impurities, whether it's four or five nines, uh, or they may state it's a metals basis, meaning they exclude much of this part of the periodic table. So how pure is pure? Well, let's look at some lanthanum. Just circled right there, that's the first member of the lanthanide series. If we talk about a four nines material, and what we compared here is Ames lanthanum to a commercial four nines lanthanum. Ours is close to five nines, but we'll call it four nines because the fifth nine's not really there. They're fairly equivalent. That's not a whole lot different. And this is an atomic basis, not weight basis. But if we start adding the metals only condition, all the elements we've added in there, we retain our four nines status. The commercial material drops down to three nines. Now let's add the interstitials or gases. We've moved down to three nines atomic purity. They're down to two nines atomic purity. So when you're talking purity, you have to know what blinders are you wearing? Are you talking about the entire periodic table, most of the periodic table, or just this portion of the periodic table? And you note even here, I've excluded hydrogen which can be wildly variable number in your material. Um, 15 years ago, I wouldn't trust a commercial number no matter what they told me, but processes have gotten a lot tighter and better, especially in China, where most commercial materials, when they're telling you four nines, they're, they will meet the bill. Um, and whether or not they report these numbers is really up to them, but we still beat their pants off when it comes to the gases. Why is this, why is this important? Here's some gas numbers up there if you want to look at them. Um, we'll get to in a minute. Is, this is another display of some purity differences. I'll just point out these are commercial sources. All those is from a while ago, uh, Dr. Schneider's study. Um, commercial materials, either ingot or distilled. And you can see how different these numbers are amongst them. And here's the Ames material. And if you look at the total purity across the entire uh, table, an atomic basis, this material is not even two nines. Distilled material is not even two nines. There were two nines. So it depend, again, depends on how you're talking about it. What's your basis?